the old um, conception of a, a powerful artist manager being able to make a career uh, is outdated. I'm Jolt Bognar, host of Living the Classical Life. Today we're speaking with Marcus Felsner, who established his own artist agency in Munich. In this conversation, we explore what it means to be a steward of musical lives. We hope you enjoy. Thank you so much for being here and joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. One of the reasons why we specifically wanted to have you was initially when I invited you, you said no. And the, the fascinating reason that you gave was you didn't really want to be the forefront of attention, saying that it's the artist who is important and not the manager. I have a somewhat untypical background for an artist manager. I spent 25 years in uh, private business, um, always provided professional services throughout my life, and consider myself a service provider, mm. and find the attitude um, somewhat strange um, to think of yourself as an important part in this equation. Um, it's about the artist meeting his or her audience, and um, he may need help and he may need a professionally organized environment to do so. Um, but that is absolutely secondary. And um, I would personally have difficulties um, to um, look at artist managers, agents as stars in their own right. I find that very strange. So, on the other hand, we have, in the days of artist as romantic hero, we also had romanticized impresarios like Saul Hirak, who figured very prominently into the, the equation. Any artist in America, for example, aspired to have representation from him. I remember reading the diaries of Van Cliburn, and he said one day he dreamed of himself at the poster Van Cliburn with Saul Hirak. And then Saul Hirak, of course, was bringing over the great Soviet artists, so there was that role. In your view, what was the role back then compared to what it is now, today? Maybe I should start by saying what I see in today's musical uh, world, where uh, information is available to all presenters about basically every artist in the world. There's a very profound understanding of repertoire, there's a profound understanding of expectations from audiences and what specific artists can offer. The number of uh, presenters, um, concert organizers, opera companies and so on, who need advice, uh, who need technical input from independent um, professionals who could suggest ideas to them has uh, gone down dramatically. Um, many of these institutions are led by artists who have their own professional understanding of what they want to, to present. And I think that has not been the case 70 or 100 years ago, where people like Sol Yurok um, could um, interest uh, presenters in artists they had never heard about and vouch for the quality they would get. Um, and Sol Yurok was um, a legendary figure that I feel not particularly close uh, to, although I used to run the European organization of what used to be Sol Yurok's uh, firm. 
And I once had a very embarrassing uh, discussion when um, somebody said to a, a very well-known conductor, um, Marcus is the new Sol Yurok, and I thought, oh my God, this is this is not going well. <laughs> uh, and um, and then he said, Marcus, if you are the new Sol Yurok, uh, you have to remember his um, number one rule, uh, which was, I will never understand why artists get 80% of my money. And um, that's funny, but it is the exact opposite of what I understand to be my profession. So I'm not entirely sure um, what kind of role model someone like uh, Mr. Euro can still be for, for us today. What I like about uh, his personality was that um, he was a very curious man who had very little understanding technically of music. He was not a musician but he had a very good understanding of what would work in front of an audience and the sense of what he could invite to America and present to an American audience was absolutely phenomenal. So that being an outsider to, to the world of music is something that appeals to me in a way in, in that sense. But otherwise, I think the needs of artists have changed quite dramatically since. So I'm curious to know a little bit about the background of what you bring to your position in the musical world. So if you started out as a business service provider, where did music come into the equation? And where did this passion come from? If, if that was there from an early age, uh, why didn't you become a musician, for example? I come from Berlin. I grew up in the western part of Berlin. Um, I come from a family where we had no books, in our home, we had no music, uh, but I was very fortunate to go to an excellent school simply because we lived next door. It was pure coincidence. Uh, and in that school, we had um, orchestras, several orchestras. Uh, many of my friends in school were taught by members of the Berlin Philharmonic, uh, the Berlin Radio Symphony uh, Orchestra. And I used to go to their chamber music, uh, house concerts, and so on, and was very impressed by, by that world. And that appealed to me. Um, I started dealing with classical music um, basically through books. I, uh, I had a, a very strange teenage time and read books I was probably in not able to understand. Uh, when I was 12, 13 years old, I read books by Thomas Mann and Dostoevsky and so on. And every musical reference in these books was something that, that intrigued me. And that is why also my career, if you will, in, in learning the repertoire started from a very awkward end with uh, Wagner, then Bruckner, then Mahler and so on. And only later did I discover uh, the works by Mozart and Bach and so on. Um, and I became, if you will, a musical omnivore. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a public library in, not far from my home uh, with a big record collection. And every day after school, I would go there and take a part of that collection home and sort of learn it, um, which was difficult in the beginning for me because I didn't understand anything and I found it horrible until I got used to that. And that is how my addiction sort of started. It was probably something that had to do with the wish to leave that world that I had grown up in and seeing the beautiful houses of my classical music friends. Um, but it became uh, a, a real need. Um, we had a wonderful program in, in Berlin where school children could go to concerts and the opera for the equivalent of three euros uh, a night. And I remember I started to work very early for, uh, to, to earn money. Um, and I would spend four or five nights a week at the opera um, and grow up with four, three euros, uh, watching 
Domingo and Pavarotti in their in their great days, and that's what got me started. Um, but then I realized I needed to find a, a profession that would earn me a living, and I took a 25-year detour, if you will, through law and and business. But throughout this time, friends, all my friends were always musicians, basically singers. Um, orchestra musicians and so on. So my private environment had always stayed that. And I started to organize my own private chamber music series in my home. So that's how it started. Um, yeah. So with that intense love of music, did you ever consider being a musician? Um, not beyond the age of 15, I would say. I... Um, because of that rather unusual upbringing, uh, I started to play the piano at a very late age and uh, got rather frustrated when after six months of studying I was still not able to play Tchaikovsky's uh, first piano concerto. Uh, and then I came across uh, a book of the famous uh, Austrian uh, writer Thomas Bernhard, uh, Der Untergeher, which Basically, it describes the story of a friend of Glenn Gould um, who um, accepts that he will never be at the level of this genius. And um, therefore, although a concert pianist uh, sells his piano to a complete talent-free young girl and never touches the instrument again. And I took that as the justification to never touch a piano again, and I never did. So it's one thing to have this incredible love of music, but it's a pretty big jump from organizing a private chamber music concert to where, to becoming where you are, uh, managing some of the, the biggest artists in the world now. How does that happen? When I made that um, move from um, leading one of the larger professional service firms to joining an artist management organization. So everybody, everybody said this must be a dramatic change and all these crazy artists and how do you deal with that and uh, what a shock. And in reality it was not such a dramatic transformation. Uh, I had always advised um, larger owner-managed businesses um, you know, in my home country, there are business organizations worth several billion dollars uh, that are run by one old lady. Mm -hmm. And um, so working with such clients can be very challenging in that they are very irrational and uh, they need an environment that helps them to deal with everyday life and realities and advising an artist and advising an entrepreneur is not that different. So it was not a big change other than now I enjoy uh, profoundly what I see every day. A nice portion of our viewers uh, consists of young musicians and aspiring performers. They are looking at what their musical paths might be, musical career if we want to call it that, and the question is, manager at all, or self-managing, at what point does this make sense? Um, does one need a manager in today's world where, if we assume that for most people the earnings are not that large, why put yourself in the position where you give a cut of this tiny amount to someone who is supposedly managing the career, but also there is now a perception that the managers will not really create a career, but join along with something that is already riding on its own momentum. It, it, I think it's very difficult to give a general answer to that. Uh, every case of every artist is different. I think there are very young artists um, teenagers who may need protection from dealing with uh, the wrong people, uh, accepting the wrong invitations, uh, playing the wrong repertoire. And management 
can and must play that role if the private environment cannot. Um, and that's not a question of money. It's a question of protecting the talent. B because of the changing um, knowledge in, in the musical world, uh, I would still say that um, the old um, conception of uh, a powerful artist manager being able to make a career uh, is outdated. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anybody in today's world has the power uh, of um, putting someone on the map of all the big uh, venues, uh, all the big opera companies, by the simple uh, force of his or her name. Um, it's a somewhat naive idea, I think, to assume that um, any artist manager can pick up the phone and um, make sure you have your Salzburg Festival debut. Um, it doesn't work that way. Um, and the uh, common uh, desire to be on a uh, on the list of a respectable artist management organization because you're surrounded by great artists that you admire is understandable, but it is not in itself a, a, a guarantee for uh, a successful career. And um, I think it's difficult uh, to give a, a general answer and every case needs to be looked at. There are artists who can perfectly move on with their artistic dream and have a fulfilling career without ever working with an agent. And that's perfectly fine. In your estimation, what are the ingredients, if there is one prescription, the essential qualities for a great manager who can really be a steward for musicians and provide for them the best opportunities? Do they have to be based in a certain location? Do they have to have a command of a certain amount of languages? And uh, first and foremost, do they have to have an in-depth knowledge of music like you do? What helps me uh, in my work is um, uh, a sense of humility, of humble service um, to an artist who is either uh, an established genius or promises to um, have a career that will make him or her a legend at some point in time and to always think of the artist as your principal in that sense. To be pragmatic and uh, practical in helping the artist to achieve uh, objectives and um, to have an independent mind that will allow the artist manager to say no um, to an artist, uh, say no to presenters, and sometimes tell an artist an uncomfortable truth, mm -hmm. because that's a, a key responsibility. And it's particularly difficult to say no uh, to an artist. Um, it's a common situation that as an artist manager you agree with an artist of how much he wants to do and how much uh, she or he wants to be protected for his private life, for studying, for learning new repertoire and so on. But then ultimately very often that same artist accepts invitations from friend, musician, uh, left, right and centre mm -hmm and then throws the whole thing at you. And then the artist manager is the one who is ultimately blamed for filling a calendar in a way that uh, looks irresponsible. So it's, it's difficult to say no, but it's important, I think. I heard you talking about the ambiguous variables that go into the creation of a legend. And I'm curious to ask about this, because if we think about some of the old world legends that have been lionized. I think of musicians like Maria Callas, who beyond her 
incredible art, of course, benefited vastly from a booming record industry at the time. She was almost um, the visible face of advertising a commodity that could be held by consumers. And back then, of course, the point is that the general public was buying recordings, and these became the hollowed names, the recognizable names. In the absence of a record industry now that works or doesn't work in the same way, are there even such legends possible for, for most artists? I'm not entirely sure if it's necessary to aspire to something that was possible under the circumstances of our time 70 years ago and simply is not possible in the same way today. Maybe also with the pandemic as a catalyst, um, we will hopefully come to some sense of uh, humbleness in uh, that we accept that um, classical music will not have the position in a public life that it had um, 70 or 100 years ago. Uh, the traditions of education are no longer there. It's not easy anymore to become a superstar. So for all of the young musicians, the students, the aspiring performers, what advice would you give to these musicians as they make their way? Is it their role, for example, to make music accessible to their audiences and to connect with them on the level of educating them um, in these cases that there isn't that deeply, um, no big foundation of, of classical music education or even of the humanities? I think it's important that every artist understands um, that it is her and his responsibility to reach audiences. Um, and, but obviously there are different ways and different levels of talent to do that. Uh, I would still say to, to every artist, if you have the choice of either practicing or making a beautiful uh, YouTube video, you should practice and try to become a better artist. That is number one priority. Um, and sometimes I have to say that uh, to some of uh, the younger artists I, uh, I work with um, who seem to be very distracted by social media and, and other things. But um, it is certainly important um, to use um, communicative abilities, especially for younger artists, um, to find a different way of talking about what they do. And every country has this kind of program where artists take half a day around the performance before or after and go to a school near uh, that place uh, where they play uh, or sing and talk about what they do and show it to students in class in, who have never been to a classical music uh, concert and expose them, and um, this has to be done constantly, and uh, hopefully will lead to something. How do you envision your role in the future? I would be over the moon if each of the artists I have the privilege to work for will achieve her own objectives artistically, um, and if the financial and the personal environment uh, works out well, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, but um, the answer to that question has to be different for each artist. Um, I had this sort of uh, grandiose ambition when I made this move um, to work with artists who have the potential of changing the way we look at music and becoming legends. And so I hope each of them uh, who has that opportunity will do so and will ultimately at the age of 70 be honored with, if that still exists by that time, um, 
a career edition from uh, a major label of all the beautiful recordings they made. Marcus, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. It's been a pleasure, and I wish you much continued success with your life, your work, and yes, your role in the lives of all the artists you help. Thank you. Thank you so much.